This morning is a field of characteristic zero and we're looking at GL N of K, the invertible N by N matrices with entries in this field. This acts on the polynomial ring in N variables X1 up to Xn with coefficients in K which I'll denote by S. So X is the ring of polynomials and N by N matrices act on polynomials in the obvious way. Right? So each variable Xi gets replaced by the corresponding linear combination uh, that comes, I guess, from the ith row of the matrix. Now, if you have a subgroup, given any subgroup G, it'll G in GLNK, uh, we want to compute, we wish to compute <coughs> the so-called invariant ring. So the invariant ring denoted S upper G is the subset of all polynomials F such that pi of F is equal to F for every element in the subgroup. So all the polynomials that are fixed under the subgroup. Now they form a subring, right? If you add two invariant polynomials or if you multiply two invariant polynomials, you get another invariant polynomial. So an example that uh, everybody is familiar with, it's our example one. If it's G, is the group of permutation matrices. So this is the uh, symmetric group Sn realized as a matrix group, namely the n by n permutation matrices, a, a group, finite group of order n factorial. And then uh, S upper G is simply the, the ring of symmetric functions or symmetric polynomials. So these are polynomials and n variables that are left invariant under permuting uh, any of the, the variables. And uh, well, that ring is generated, I think most of you know this, by the elementary symmetric polynomials and also by the power sums since we're in characteristic zero. So this is a, a very simple example that uh, is familiar to many. Let's do a, a second example. Let's take G to be the cyclic group of order four realized as a matrix group. One, zero, zero, one, the identity matrix minus the identity matrix. Then we'll take uh, zero, one, minus one, zero, and zero, minus one, one, zero. So rotations by 90 degree, 180 degree, 270 degree, and the identity in the plane. So we're interested in polynomials in X and Y that are left invariant. So now, of course, it's enough to uh, specify this condition where I say here for every group element we want to be invariant, it suffices to specify this for generators of the group. So if you're left invariant by generators of the group, then you're left invariant by everybody. So it suffices to just take a rotation by 90 degrees, which generates the group. So we're interested in polynomials such that f of x, y is equal to f of minus y, x. Right? So this rotation replaces uh, x by negative y and y by x. Let's uh, say this group element generates the group. And I claim that this is minimally generated by three polynomials, x squared plus y squared, x squared times y squared, and x cubed y minus x y cubed. So check that these three polynomials are invariant under the substitution. And I claim that every other polynomial in the world that's invariant can be expressed non-uniquely 
as a polynomial in these three invariants. To uh, quantify the non-uniqueness, we uh, assign new names, A, B, and C, to these three generators. So I call this A, B, C. Well, I have three polynomials and two variables. They're algebraically dependent using implicitization. We learned about that in the second lecture. We calculate the implicit equation. C squared minus A squared B plus 4 B squared. Okay, so this is the same ring. And uh, so this uh, ideal quantifies the non-uniqueness, right? So I could replace C squared by the other stuff over there. And uh, this quantifies the non-uniqueness in the representation. Now how to think about this geometrically? So geometrically, this is the coordinate ring. of a certain variety, right? Every, whenever you take a polynomial ring, mod and ideal, it's the coordinate ring of the variety that's the zero set of that ideal. Now what, how should we think about this zero set? Well, this zero set is a surface in three-dimensional space with coordinates A, B, and C. Points on that surface correspond to orbits in the plane. So this is the orbit space or quotient space So we take the plane and in a natural way, you know, we can identify the, the orbits uh, under the action. So typical orbit under rotation by 90 degrees will have four points. There's one special orbit, the origin. But in any case, every orbit uniquely corresponds to a, uh, a triple ABC that satisfies this equation, right? So, so geometrically, the reason we form ring of invariants, we're fun invariant functions are functions on the orbit space, and we're interested in, in taking quotients in an algebraic setting. Um, let's do one example. First example where the group is not finite. So let's take K to be K star, the multiplicative group of non-zero scalars, the one-dimensional algebraic torus and let it act on a polynomial ring in three variables x, y, and z and the action I'm going to pick it's a diagonal action x gets replaced by t squared x y gets replaced by t cubed y and z gets replaced by t to the minus 7, for example, z. Okay, so uh, t is a non-zero scalar, so t is an element in this multiplicative group, and then this is an action. So I'm interested, you know, which polynomials are invariant if I scale x by t squared, y by t cubed, and if I divide z by t to the seventh. Okay. Well, that turns out to be a, a nice combinatorics problem. So here, the ring of invariance is as a vector space generated by monomials. So when I write curly brackets, I mean the vector space generated by. If I write the sharp bracket, I mean the k-algebra generated by. So as a vector space, this is generated by monomials. And the monomials are those that satisfy the equation 2i plus 3j is equal 7k. All right, so monomial is invariant um, if and only if, you know, this equation is satisfied. Right? Just check it. You plug in, right? You plug in, take a monomial, right? And then the exponent you see, you know, 2i plus 3j minus 7k and you want that to be zero, right? You want t to, to the zero to that be one, okay? So we have the problem to solve a system of one linear homogeneous equation in three unknowns, i, j, and k, in the only number domain that would be acceptable to the ancient Greeks, the non-negative integers. I'm lying a little bit, they had some issues with zero, but so we want to solve this equation among non-negative integers, and uh, there are four basic solutions, so we can write them as x to the seventh, z squared, 
x squared, y, z, x, y to the fourth, z squared, y to the seventh, z cubed. Okay, so those are the generators. Well, how can you see that? Well, in the three-dimensional space with coordinates i, j, and k, this defines a plane. Right? So we want to take that plane and intersect it with a non-negative orthant. Right? So that looks like this. Right? That's a, a kind of cone. Right? If I intersect that plane with a non-negative orthant, I get a two-dimensional cone sitting in three space. That two-dimensional cone has a bunch of lattice points, and we're interested, you know, in the lattice points that generate the semigroup of all lattice points in this cone. And uh, this is called a, sometimes people call this a Hilbert basis. So this is a combinatorics problem, right, of fi find identifying this. And I'm going to delegate to Abraham. So if you have any questions among, about solving non-negative uh, linear equations among non-negative integers, then Abraham will tell you how to do that. Uh, say normalese is okay, so let's, let's do this in normalese and the other software packages, but that's a standard problem to find the, uh, the generators in this case. So the group action here is a group action by a torus, so we're interested in torus invariance and quotients by a torus action, very relevant issue indeed for the uh, people who do toric topology later in August here in Dijon. Okay, now the big question that uh, we like to address, uh, one big question we like to address in invariant theory, is it always possible to find such a finite generating set? So is the ring of invariance always finitely generated as a k-algebra. Is it always the case for any matrix group that there's a finite list of invariant polynomials that generate all the invariant polynomials? Now, we will see the answer um, today. Now, first of all, why is this a non-trivial question, right? So as a student, you know, your students who maybe just worked through Cox and Lochet, they will say, well, that's obvious, right? Ideals are finally generated. Every ideal is finally generated, so therefore this is finally generated. Well, that's not true. Ideals are finally generated, but subalgebras are not, right? So in the polynomial ring in two variables, if you take the subalgebra generated by x, xy, xy squared, xy cubed, xy to the fourth, and so on, you cannot omit any generator. So subalgebras are generally not finally generated. Ideals are, but subrings are not. Okay, so let's address this question. <coughs> So here's the first theorem to Helbot. <coughs> and beautiful paper in 1890. Highly recommended reading. Translated in English. You don't have to talk to Rainer to get the German version, right? You can read this in English. So I always tell my students there's nothing, there are many good things to do, but one of the best things you can spend your time with reading the 19th century math literature. And many authors, you know, have written in English, Sylvester, Cayley, and so on, and many of the key papers are translated into English. Okay, so Hilbert showed that the answer is yes. For example, if G is a finite group. So I'm going to prove this to you. Okay. Next 15 minutes, I'd like to prove to you that the invariant ring is finitely generated k-algebra if G is a finite group of n by n matrices. There any questions? Please interrupt me. Even clear? Okay. So we're going to do that using 
what's called the Reynolds operator. So that's a, a linear map, which I'm going to call star, from the polynomial ring to the subring of invariance. And it's the averaging operator. So star stands for averaging. So what do you do? You take a polynomial and you map it to its average under the group, by which I mean 1 over g times the sum pi in g pi of f. Okay, so, well, this makes sense for two reasons. A, the group G is finite, right? So, and B, the characteristic is zero, right? So you can divide by the group order. So since G is finite and since the characteristic is zero, we can average a polynomial over the group. Now this Reynolds operator has the following three properties. These are essential properties of the Reynolds operator. Well, property A, star is a k-linear map. That's pretty easy to see, right? I mean, if you average the sum, it's the same as summing the average. It's, it's certainly k-linear. B, second property, star, is the identity on the image, on SG. Yeah? So if you feed, if you put in a polynomial that's already invariant and you average, you get the same thing back. That's also pretty clear, right? If, because then, you know, well, they're all equal, right? Pi of f is equal to f for every pi, and then you add up, you know, and then you divide by the number of times you add. So that's uh, trivial. So the most Non-trivial part, so my property C, let's squeeze this in here, St star is an SG module homomorphism. Okay? So IE, so it's a homomorphism of SG modules. Well, SG is a subalgebra of S. Well, that turns the polynomial ring into a module over the small ring, right? If you are a small ring inside a big ring, then the big guy is a module over the little guy, right? Because, you know, well, if you take an element in the subring and multiply it with something in the big ring, you stay in the big ring, right? And it's linear. So, let me write this out. So the module property said that F, G, star, the homomorphism property says that fg star is the same as f star times g for every g that's already invariant. Okay? So, say this again. So, if you have some polynomial called Bob, okay, and you multiply Bob with an invariant, and then you average the product, right? Then, well, you might have, well, you know, just averaged Bob and then multiplied with the invariant. That's the same thing. Right? So, multiplying with an invariant and then averaging is the same as first averaging and then multiplying with an invariant. And again, you know, it's a quick, easy check by, by plugging in. Okay. Okay. So let's prove Hilbert's theorem. <coughs> So first of all, by property A, the invariant ring is the k-vector space as a k-vector space spanned by the symmetrized monomials. So by symmetrized monomial, well, I mean a monomial x1 to the e1, x2 to the e2, up to xn to the en, and then 
your symmetry. So why is that? Well, the polynomial ring is spanned by monomials, right? So every polynomial is a linear combination of monomials, but then its symmetrization is the, lin the same linear combination of the symmetrized monomials. So, okay, so it's the k-vector space spanned by symmetrized monomials. Now, if E is it not the zero vector, if the exponent vector is not the zero vector, so this is not the monomial one, so if this is a non-one monomial, all other monomials generate an ideal. These symmetrized monomials generate an ideal, an ideal IG, which I'm going to denote by S plus upper G inside S. Okay? Well, what do I mean by this notation? So this I mean the set of all homogeneous invariants of positive degree. Right? So I look at all the invariants other than the constants. And that's the ideal generated by, the ideal generated by those, and that's the same as generated. So I take the set of all infinitely many, infinitely many symmetrized monomials. And they generate an ideal. Now here's the shocking news. The news from 1890 is that ideals are finally generated. That's Hilbert's basis theorem. Okay? This argument, this very argument, is why the basis theorem was proved. But of course we proved it using Dixon's lemma and so on. This step is why Hilbert proved the basis lemma, basis theorem. Okay, okay so it's finally generated as an ideal. So very good. So Hilbert basis theorem says that we can pick a finite subset. So there exists a finite subset of symmetrized monomials that generate this ideal. So I'm going to call them G1, G2, up to Gm. Yeah, so Hilbert's basis theorem says that every ideal is finally generated, but there's a slightly stronger version that says if you have an infinite generating set, then there is a finite subset that generates the same ideal. Okay? So these guys are invariants. So I found by a non-constructive argument, I found a list of invariants, G1 up to Gm, that generates the ideal I sub G. Mm -hmm. Well, I claim that's it. So I claim that the ring of invariants is in fact generated by those same invariants. G1, G2, up to Gm, they suffice to generate the ring of invariants. So as soon as you have a list of positive degree homogeneous invariants that generate the ideal of invariants, then those same invariants suffice to generate the ring of invariants. Okay, so why? Well, suppose not. Okay, so let's proceed by contradiction. Suppose they didn't generate. Well, then there exists, you know, some criminal in the difference, right? So let's pick an H that's invariant but is not in the subalgebra generated by G1 up to Gm, right? These guys are invariant, so certainly the left-hand side contains the right-hand side. If they're not equal, then we can pick something that's in the left-hand side but not in the right-hand side. Let's pick such an H. And let's pick it of smallest degree. Okay, so the non-negative integers are well-ordered, so there exists such an H whose degree a non-negative integer is as small as possible. Well, we can write H as F1 G1 plus F2 G2 plus plus F M G M in S. Now we can find polynomials 
non-invariant polynomials f1, f2 up to fm that express h as a linear combination of the g's and that's because h is in here. Right? So h, whatever it is, is a homogeneous invariant of positive degree so it's in this ideal so it's an s-linear combination of these guys. Uh, furthermore, we can arrange it so that the degree of the fi are strictly less, each fi has degree strictly less than h, well it's a homogeneous representation. So all this h is homogeneous, the g's are homogeneous, and, uh, and therefore um, we can choose the fi to be homogeneous of degree uh, less than h. Right? So if, otherwise if it were equal then, then one of the g's would be a constant right? and they, they were assumed to be non-constant. Okay? Now we're done basically. Right? So let's take h and let's observe that h is equal to h star by property b. Well we haven't used b and c yet. Right? So we're now using b to argue that h star is equal to h and now watch it. Now we're going to use c. Okay? So by c this is the same as f1 star g1 f2 star g2 blah blah fm star gm. Right? Because property C said this is a module homomorphism. So the little fine print I wrote here, you know, is exactly this condition. Right? So the G's are invariants and I star them separately, I might as well pull each GI out because GI is an invariant. Okay? Um, okay, well that implies that Fi star is in the subring generated by G1 up to GM. Well, why is that? Well, whatever it is, Fi star is an invariant, right? It's an invariant. Its degree is strictly less than the degree of H. But H was the smallest criminal, right? So there is nobody smaller than H in degree that's in the difference, right? So therefore, each Fi is in there, and that's a contradiction, and that's the end of the proof, okay? Well, that's the proof. For a finite matrix group, the ring of invariants is finally generated. Any questions? Spencer. So the only non-constructed part of this is the generator? For the ideal. Okay. That was the only. So, you know, you can read this, this you know, there's this, uh, charming, you know, romantic history, Gordon, you know, the king of invariants, the advisor, failed advisor, I guess, of Eminota, you know, exclaimed, you know, that uh, this is theology, not mathematics, blah, blah, blah. So everybody knows the story, but fewer people know that Gordon was actually a pretty smart guy. He went on, you know, five, six years later to invent Grobner bases. Okay, so these guys knew a thing or two. Okay, so Note the following, and Gordon's paper on Grobner base was published in 1900 in French, and I don't think it's translated into English, so you can read it in French. So the same argument <coughs> works also for infinite matrix groups, certain infinite matrix groups for infinite Mate for an infinite matrix group G provided there is a Reynolds operator that admit for an that admits a a Reynolds operator. Okay? So that's all you need. So if I can find a map, star, a vector space, homomorphism, epimorphism from uh, all polynomials to the invariant polynomials, that's a homomorphism with respect to the invariant that's a, and fixes the invariant ring, then I'm in business. Then exactly the same argument will prove finite generation. Okay? And such groups are called reductive. 
So a matrix, a group of matrices, of n by n matrices, is said to be reductive if there is such an operator star. And then if you have such a reductive group, then the ring of invariance is finally generated by the same proof. Excuse me. Yes. Should is, is the G, G1 to GM necessarily be ground basis? No. To, to guarantee the just, just generating set. All we need is a finite generating set. We can, we can guarantee the FIS degrees smaller than H if, if the G1... Uh, well, I want to... Okay, so I want the Gs to be homogeneous. Okay. Right? So I... To be a little bit careful. So IG is a homogeneous ideal. So certainly if I calculate the reduced Gartner base in any term order, the elements will be homogeneous. But any homogeneous generating set for this homogeneous ideal will suffice for this argument. Other questions? Um, well, a little bit about computation. So there's Noether's degree bound. So this is M in Noether. In a short 1915 paper, she shows, again, same hypotheses. We're still uh, in uh, characteristic zero, finite group that SG is generated by invariance of degree at most the group order. Okay. And we've already seen one example where this bound is tight, right? We looked at the uh, cyclic group of order four generated by rotations by 90 degree. The order is four and the ring was generated by uh, invariance of degree 2, 4, and 4. Okay, so that's an example where this bound is tight. And the bound is tight. You can always, for any group order, you can cook up an example where the bound is tight. Now here's a very important theorem that I like a lot. That's Moline's theorem <coughs> from 1897. Moline was a Russian military officer, so he proved uh, the following thing. The Hilbert series, of course at those days it wasn't called Hilbert series, right? So there was some other language and aren't you dying to know what people called Hilbert series in 1890? Wouldn't it be interesting that you as a scholar to find out what they were called, right? How, what, what people, what do people call groups before they were called groups? Right? People worked with groups long before groups were axiomatized. People you know, worked with Hilbert series before their Hilbert proved this theorem. Right? So it's very interesting to, to go back and, and read these old papers. So anyway, so the Hilbert series um, of the invariant ring is the average of something. Is the average of the inverted characteristic polynomials. Inverted characteristic polynomials of all group elements. Okay, so that's the wordy version. That's the sentence, right? So we take all the group elements, we make a finite list of matrices. Each matrix has a characteristic polynomial. It's a polynomial in one variable of degree n. Then you invert it, right? That's a rational function. You add them up. That's a rational function. And then that's a rational function, one variable. Then you Taylor series it, and you get the Hilbert series. So let me, let's write it in symbols. So the Hilbert series, which is the formal generating function, d from 0 to infinity, then the k dimension of sg in degree d, z to the d. Okay, so this is the generating function for the dimensions of the graded components in the ring of invariance. Okay, so this is the generating function. So this integer here is the number of linearly independent homogeneous invariants of degree d. And then the statement is this is 1 over the group order 
average overall matrices in the group and then one over the characteristic polynomial and I'm going to rewrite the characteristic polynomial just a tiny bit. I'm going to write it as the identity minus z times g. Okay, so usually you go g minus z times the identity. Right? G is a matrix. So usually, you know, but I'm going to write it like this and, this, and it becomes actually true. Okay. So that's a, a very nice theorem. Let's check this in an example. <clears throat> So let's check this for rotations by 90 degrees. So let's calculate the Moline series or Hilbert series of our invariant ring is the following thing, right? So we pretend you don't know that this is generated by elements of degree 2, 4, 4 and pretend you don't know the relation A, B, C that was on the board earlier. So we don't know that, right? So we just want to do it from first principles. So then we take 1 over the group order and then we average the characteristic polynomials. So 1 minus Z, 0, 0, 1 minus Z, inverse. So by this I just mean the determinant of this 2 by 2 matrix and then the reciprocal. Okay, plus, that's for the identity element, and then for minus the identity, we take 1 plus z, 0, 0, 1 plus z, reciprocal, plus 1, z, z, 1, and there should be a minus z here. That's rotation by 270 degrees, 270 degrees, and then finally, 1 minus z, uh, z1 minus 1, okay, and then you average this. Now, of course, once you think about this for the first time, I mean, the, the time, by the time you do your second example, you realize the characteristic polynomial only depends on the conjugacy class, right? So you'll be leveling, you know, if your group has order 120 and you write this out by hand, then, you know, very soon you wonder whether when two matrices you know have the same characteristic polynomial and you figure out a few things but here we write them all out so this is you know one quarter so this is one over one minus z squared plus one over one plus z squared like that and then these two guys have the same characteristic polynomial so it's two over one plus z squared, and I think I have a typo, yeah. I think it's like this, okay? And then you type this into Sage something, and you get 1 minus z to the 8, 1 minus z squared, 1 minus z to the 4th squared, okay? And then, uh, you know, the experts on syzygies, you know, you ask Kang Jin, he looks at this, he says, obviously, you know, he will say, he looks at this one second, he will say, obviously, this is a cone Macaulay ring, you know, generated with the quadratic generator A and two quartic generators B and C with the relation in degree 8. If you don't know how that goes, you talk to him, okay? So, and that is indeed true, okay? So, but of course, if you're not that quick, you type this again into Sage and ask for the Taylor series blah 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 and you can just read off the number of linearly independent invariants in every degree right so we know there's the constants there are no linear invariants under rotation of 90 degrees there's one quadratic invariant no cubic invariant three quartic invariants and so on you can go as high as you want Okay, algorithm. So this all translates into an algorithm. So for finite groups. Okay, so whenever you write an algorithm, the first thing you write is the input 
and then you write the output, and then you write the steps. But since I have so little space, I'm just going to recite the input and the output. So input is a finite group of n by n matrices with entries in a field k of characteristic 0. For instance, to list all the matrices. Okay? Output is a finite set of polynomials, g1 up to gm, that are invariant and generate the ring of invariance. And I'm going to state this informally. So you produce invariance of low degree using the Reynolds operator. Okay, so you just start. Let's say gee, let me produce all invariants up to degree at most 3, right? Well, you just make a list of all monomials, you put a star on everything, and you certainly get a generating set for all vector space of all invariants of at most that degree. Okay, so let's get started with that. So then you have some list of invariants that you like, and then you compute the Hilbert series of what you got. Compute the Hilbert series of the current subalgebra. Right, so you have a bunch of invariants, but they don't generate the algebra yet. But to measure our progress, we're going to you know, calculate the Hilbert series of the algebra they generate so far. How do we do that? We first implicitize. We calculate a Grobner basis. So we do all the stuff you know, we learned in the course. And we get the Hilbert series for the current subalgebra. Okay. Well, then you check whether you're done. Check whether done via Moline. Right? The Hilbert series of the current subalgebra is a rational function in Z. Moline gives you another rational function in Z. Well, you just check. You know, you have two rational functions in Z, and just check are they the same rational function. If they are the same rational, you're done. And your current invariants generate the ring of invariants. Okay? If not, then you know, the expansion of your series somewhere and some coefficient is smaller than the expansion of the Hilbert series. That tells you where to hunt next. Right? So maybe the two series agree up to, the, you know, up to d equals 9. Then you don't need to produce any invariants in degree 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9. Then you jump to degree 10. And you do a couple more Reynolds steps there until you have more invariance and do it again. So if not, increase the degree. That's it. So you do that until the current Hilbert series agrees with the Moline series. Now for the impatient among us, such as me, it's always good to have some global upper bound, you know, so certainly you're going to be done by the time you reach the group order. Okay? Any questions? So that's the finite generation, ring of invariants for finite matrix groups, and how you can produce these invariants, and you can practice this at one or two examples this afternoon. Any questions? Let's take a four-minute break until 10.48.